Friends, it's a joy to be in the pulpit. The past two weeks, we've been in this sermon series, Won't You Be My Neighbor, inspired by the second most famous graduate of Pittsburgh Theological Seminary, the Reverend Fred Rogers. Now, at this point, you're supposed to ask, well, who was the most famous graduate of Pittsburgh Theological Seminary? <laughs> so thank you for humoring my poor jokes. But... Fred Rogers really is a hero of mine, and it was wonderful to hear from Carolyn Kurtz about our neighbors in Maji. And last week, the Star Church traveled to uh, the Tri Cities in Washington. But I understand that Shanna gave one of the best sermons of her career based upon the scene of all children. So I have this of following Pastor Shanna in this sermon series that I'm really grateful for. But I want us to begin today by allowing Reverend Rogers to set up our theme. This is an interview that Fred did in either 1967 or 1968, I forget. Um, but follow his logic, and we will introduce our sermon today. About modulation. It seems to me that there are different things in life. And one of my main jobs, it seems to me, is to help through the mass media for children, to help children through some of the difficult modulations of life. Because it's easy, for instance, to go from C to F. But there are some modulations that aren't so easy. For instance, to go from F to F sharp, you've got to weave through all sorts of things. And it seems to me if you've got somebody to help you, as you weave, maybe this is just too philosophical. Maybe I'm trying to, to combine uh, things that, that can't be combined, but it makes sense to me. The difficult modulations of life, and Stacy probably knows what it's like to go from F to F sharp. I don't understand that, but I do know that there are times in my life where it is difficult to make transitions. And I suspect very strongly that you too know what it's like to go from a place where life is pretty comfortable and okay, but then life presents you with, with a scenario that you were never expecting. And it is difficult to live into that next moment. And that's what I want us to focus on today. Now last week, Shanna read from, taught from Jesus' parable of, uh, or not the parable, but the greatest commandment. What is the greatest commandment? Love the Lord your God, love your neighbor as yourself. So I'm using the Luke text today, which sounds very familiar. What Scott read for us today was almost verbatim what Shanna read last week, but it's a Luke's gospel that digs deeper into this idea of neighbor as we talk about the modulations the uncomfortable transitions of life. So our New Testament reading comes to us from Luke chapter 10, picking up where Scott left off in verse 29. The lawyer who was questioning Jesus was wanting to justify himself. So he asked Jesus, well, who is my neighbor? So Jesus replied, a man was going down from Jerusalem to Jericho and fell into the hands of robbers who stripped him, who beat him, and went away, leaving him half dead. Now by chance, a priest was going down that road, and when he saw him, he passed by the other side. But a Samaritan, while traveling, came near, and when he saw him, he was moved with pity, and he went to him and bandaged his wounds, and having poured oil and wine on them, then he put him on his own animal, brought him to an inn, Took care of him. The next day he took out two denarii and gave them to the innkeeper and said, Take care of him. 
And when I come back, I will repay you whatever you spend. Which of these three do you think was a neighbor to the man who fell into the hands of the robbers? And the lawyer replied, well, the one who showed him mercy. And Jesus said to him, go and do likewise. <laughs> Sisters and brothers, this is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. This is an incredibly rich parable about who our neighbor is today. In fact, this is so rich that I believe this is a two-sermon series just in and of itself. So I'm only going to preach half of it this week to keep you all pleased. We don't go over time today. But the man in the parable is on a journey. And he experiences one of those difficult modulations of life as he journeys from Jerusalem to Jericho. Friends, this is a hard road for him, isn't it? Let's dig deeper. I want to show you a picture of the road from Jerusalem to Jericho. Now you see it up here on the screen, and that green line is about 18 miles. And you'll notice that it weaves and winds its way through some pretty mountainous terrain. This mountainous terrain is so wild that there is about 3,300 feet of ele elevation distance. Jericho, over here, is 800 feet-ish below sea level. Jerusalem is about 2,500 feet above sea level. And here's the next picture. This, you have an arrow coming down to the road. You see deep canyons on this journey, full of turns, places where you can't see. And given the context of the time, the economy was fairly poor, Rome was in charge, and there were a lot of robbers and barons who liked to hang out in these wild hills, taking advantage of travelers, making their way from Jerusalem to Jericho, or vice versa. <clears throat> this road was difficult. And in fact, I believe that this road gives us a good portrait and metaphor for our own lives, right? Because that final section down in the Jordan Valley from Jericho is pretty easy, right? But we too journey along life's passageways where we don't necessarily know what's coming around the corner. And often, there are physical or spiritual robbers and thieves along the way who want to take advantage of us, oftentimes leaving us for half dead. Friends, I believe that this is a story lesson, a parable. In two parts, our Lord Jesus is such a masterful teacher. This is a story of who we are and this is also a story of who we are becoming. That's next week's sermon. But I want us to focus on who we are this week. Because friends, I believe that Jesus is calling us to identify not just with the Good Samaritan, but also with the character who finds himself half dead along the side of the road. I don't know about you, but it seems to me that in the life of our congregation, there is a lot going on. I see people who are not here this week because some of them are in the hospital. Our friend Steve Tyree has spent the weekend in the hospital. I know some of you sitting here today have been dealing with parents at some place along their own journey that is tiring and painful and we wrestle with questions of life living abundant or life living with Jesus. And these places are hard. And sometimes it feels like we don't have much energy left over. We've been dealing with sickness in our congregation, not just coughs and colds, but deeper, more painful illnesses that affect us. Some of us are burying loved ones this week. This road that we journey on can be difficult, 
challenge you. And sometimes on this journey of life, we feel like we are living like we are half dead. Now there is an incredible richness to this parable, right? The, the speakers, the teachers of the church, the priest, the Levite, they walk by. And maybe the half-dead man is like, yes, yeah, someone finally coming to help me. And those good church people just keep walking by. Now we can spend two sermons about the lessons or the reasons of why they may have walked by. And it's not until the Samaritan, the other, the one who traditionally we are not supposed to be in contact with. It's not until the other comes along and shows the half-dead man mercy that the man in the parable finds relief. Now, some of you may be sitting here thinking, you know, I'm with you, Kevin, but I'm in a pretty decent place in my life. I've got enough money in the bank account. My health is good. My family for today is doing okay. I don't feel like the half-dead man in the parable, but I want to challenge not just those of us who are feeling this acutely in our own families these days, but I want to challenge all of us to identify with the half-dead man lying on the side of the road who is in need of some help. Because I believe that there are powers and principalities in this world trying to attack the very heart of us taking us away from this loving relationship with God. Friends, I believe that there are bandits on this road of your life who are calling you to bow down to your ego because this is the culture in which we live. You can do whatever you want. You can do it if you just work hard enough. It's all about you, you, you in this society of individualism. But there are bandits, spiritual bandits, asking you to bow down to gods who are not sharing love and peace to God who is not revealed in Jesus Christ. Friends, these are spiritual bandits. Friends, as you journey on this road of life, there are thieves on your road trying to steal the thanksgiving in your heart. Say, well, oh, well, this fancy job, I did that on my own. I don't need to thank God. I don't need to show up to church every Sunday or say my prayers. There are thieves who say, you are just good as you are. And these thieves steal our thanksgiving that gives us life in our Lord Jesus. And as we journey this road of life, wherever we are, there are robbers on the journey trying to rob our righteousness, believing that it's okay if we just let this one thing slide here in my own spiritual life. And we can be quick to judge others, but never do we look inside the soul of ourselves. There are robbers on this road looking to rob you of the righteousness that you find in Jesus Christ. And as we journey through life, we fall down to fear. Fearing what's going to happen to our family or to our bank accounts or to my life. And fear can rob us of this abundant life that we find in Jesus. As all of us travel, my friends, there are robbers and thieves looking to steal from your goodness. And friends, I posit to you, let all of us, spiritually and some of us physically, we are all the person lying half dead on the road from where we've come from, from where we are going. And who's going to help? I believe that the Good Samaritan in this story, this other one who's not supposed to help you on the journey, is a messianic figure, maybe giving us allusions to Jesus, who goes out of his way, who doesn't need to help you, who overcomes the fear of helping the other on the side of the road and goes to great cost. 
for the sake of your spiritual life. Friends, I believe this Good Samaritan is a Jesus figure, and I say all this to take us back to the first question. The lawyer is asking, Lord, what is it that I need to, to do to inherit eternal life? And Jesus asks him the question, well, what do the commandments say? And this young lawyer responds because he's heard Shanna's sermon. He's heard Jesus say, you've got to love God and love your neighbor. And Jesus says, do this and you will live. And the lawyer, who represents a lot of us, says, oh, who is my neighbor? And Jesus tells this rich story. And at the end of the parable, Jesus asks the question, who is this man's neighbor? And they respond by saying, the one who showed mercy. Now, friends, I believe that the neighbor is the Good Samaritan, too. But the direct answer to the question, the neighbor is not the Good Samaritan. Uh, going out in his own life to help the person who is lying dead on the side of the road, the neighbor is the one who shows me mercy. Whoever is showing you mercy in your life, this is the first part of the question of who is your neighbor? The Samaritan, the other, is the neighbor. The one who shows mercy is your neighbor. And if this story is an allusion to what Jesus is going to do for your life, Jesus is our neighbor. We must love God and we must love the one who shows us mercy. And I want to ask you, church, how are we doing at loving Jesus? Friends, how are we doing at loving the ones who share mercy and peace with the world? Because this is how we inherit eternal life, by loving God and loving the one who shows us mercy. Now, Fred Rogers was a terrific graduate of that fine institution of Pittsburgh Theological Seminary, right? So he knows the story of the Good Samaritan by heart. In fact, I would dare say that this question of neighbor is the is he gets the idea of the name for his show from this very parable itself. Won't you be my neighbor? And Fred does a terrific job of summarizing where he gets the theme of his show, Won't you be my neighbor? I'm going to let him speak to this right now. Well, I suppose it's an invitation. Won't you be my neighbor? Uh, it's an invitation for uh, somebody to be close to you. Now, I think everybody longs to be loved and longs to know that he or she is lovable. And consequently, the greatest thing that we can do is to help somebody know that they're loved and capable of love. Consequently, Fred says, the greatest thing that we can do is to let someone know that they are loved capable of loving. And this is the gospel in a nutshell. This is the parable of the Good Samaritan in a nutshell. We need to know that we are loved, that in our half-deadness, lying on the side of the road of life, that there is someone who will come, who sees you where you are, and goes to great sacrifice to bring you life. And this person is Jesus. Consequently, we need to know that we are loved. And the sermon next week is that we are capable of loving someone else. So friends, if you are convicted that yes, 
I am just a half-dead person lying on the side of the road, and I need some help. I need Jesus to come pick me up. I want you to take a moment to rededicate your life to the one who shows you mercy so that you may find Friends, let's pray. Lord Jesus, we love you. We want to love you more. We do want to find this idea of eternal life. So often, uh, life throws us curveballs. A sickness diagnosis comes along unexpected. A loved one passes away way too early. And we confess that our hearts hurt and we need a Savior. Lord, help us to love you. The one who didn't need to come help us, you come and love us and go to great expense at the cost of giving your own life that we may have life. So Lord, help us to love you for you are the neighbor who shows us that we are loved. This we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Friends, Jesus indeed gave us all that he had, that we may have life. What shall we render and return to this amazing grace? Will the ushers come forward to receive the offering?
uh, without significant pain. So Fred, we're glad that you're here and excited to learn from you after worship. Lynette King asks for prayers for Chuck, Chase, and Jim, who are off on a hunting adventure. Um, and she offers a praise for the choir. Indeed, that is a joy in our church. Anonymous, Jesus asks for prayers for law enforcement, their families, and all they come in contact with. And we're blessed to have two families directly uh, involved with uh, law enforcement. So we pray, we pray for you. Carol P. asks for prayers for her cousin Denny and uh, praise of healing for a cancerous kidney. Sue Sterling uh, reminds us of an old friend in the Spargo family. Some of you who were here a while ago know Brenda and Tom Spargo. Tom passed away uh, about two weeks ago in Florida, uh, and Brenda, his wife, was a, a past music director, so we lift the Spargos up in prayer. I think Judy Mendiola was moved to see John Dileski in the choir, and she offers a prayer. Please, God. Find a heart for John. Uh, anonymous, Jesus asks for prayers for justice in the situation uh, happening in the Middle East. Pray for the souls of the dead Kurds, we pray. And our brother E.T. asks for prayers for all those serving and protecting our country and all their families, indeed. This world is a complex place, right? But I think Mr. Rogers is right. The essence, people just need to know that they are loved and capable of loving. Let's pray. Lord, we lift up to you the names and places that are offered here in worship. We do pray for this country, that we would be a country of light and of love. And we confess, Lord, that there are significant challenges of which there are probably not easy solutions, but we do believe that there can be solutions that are grounded in the deep love of our neighbor. So help us. Help us to love you. Help us to see Jesus as the one who goes out of his way to save us and love him. And therefore, how can we love others? We pray for our church, that this is a community where we grow, not only in numbers, but maybe even more importantly, in our hearts, that we may know the amazing grace that we sing about, that we may share that with our neighbors, that covenant may be 